So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the June free webinar. And I'm really pleased to have Karen Harrison with us. And Karen works for or owns and founded the company Team, Team Gene. And in her words, she supports athletes from a genetic perspective, creating bespoke reports based on individual requirements. And I've interacted with Karen a number of times and uh, she's got an incredible ability to turn complex science, especially genetic related science into understandable language. Um, so I really appreciate her work. Uh, we had her on uh, another webinar last year, which was really excellent as well. So she's given um, one of her topical topics, uh, bone health from a genetic perspective that she's going to cover tonight, which involves some estrogen metabolism and obviously the genetics around that. Like the usual webinar format, I'll let Karen run with her presentation. We've got the chat box, so I'm going to get you to use that. If there's any questions that come to mind as Karen's talking, just fire them through on the chat box. If there's anything that I think is really relevant to what she's talking about now, I'll unmute and ask her that question. Otherwise, we'll have a, a Q&A um, at the end. So we'll have about 40, 45 minutes presentation. I'm just going to tell you uh, quickly about the upcoming course and another webinar next week. And uh, then we'll be on to the Q&As. So, Karen, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Ian. It's lovely to see you all. And the fact that it is school holidays, I thought it was just going to be myself and Ian that was going to be recording us <laughs> talking to each other. Um, so that's absolutely lovely. Um, I do run Team Gene and, and effectively I look at genetics not from a different perspective. I, I try and look at the person as a whole and I also try and look at what that person's trying to achieve and then I try and put a report together specifically for them. So, um, so hopefully you'll enjoy what I'm going to speak to you about this evening. And I have to say, I like to try and think a little bit out of the box. Um, and some of the things you may or may not have even heard of before in as much as theories. Um, and so therefore, I hope that you'll be able to learn a little bit this evening as well. So no further ado, let's let's get started. So um, oh, here we go. Yeah. So I'm going to recap with regards to genetics. So like Ian said, I did do um, a webinar last year. There is a longer sort of um, uh, description about the genetics in that one. I'll go over that. I'm going to go through females and their rhythms because us females have got lots of different rhythms as well as men. I don't want to obviously um, lick leave you guys out but females tend to have one or two um, uh, separate uh, rhythms um, i'm going to do a bit of an introduction to bones which we all have hopefully um, and also in regards to estrogen bone inflammation and a genetic link as well um, estrogen receptors and the bone health and then all the cofactors that are involved in those so and then I'll do a big sum up at the very end now what I can't do this evening pretty much is a huge sort of dive into all of this um, I can help you with more of this sort of on a, on a private basis or through Ian um, but yeah I won't be delving really deep into each particular subject but hopefully I'll be able to give you or introduce you to the concepts that females and estrogen and bone health and inflammation and cofactors and the genetics behind it. So all that in about 45 minutes. So let's have a go. So let's have a quick recap in regards to genetics. So effectively, the genetics really, um, we're looking at nutrigenomics. It's all about the it's never one real gene that we're trying to look at. The, the human body is a very complex uh, system and one gene might affect another and affect another. So I'm always looking for pretty much somebody will say to me, what about this gene? And I'll go, yeah, but what about everything else that's involved with it? All right. So 
it is looking at the the interaction between nutrition and genes and that's what really sort of floats my boat so how is it that we can eat some things and that'll have an effect or is it that our genes are having an effect on what we're actually eating and how it actually behaves in the body so yeah so I, I get really excited about that sort of thing so um, DNA, um, we all have it, and um, it's pretty much um, a great big string of letters that we that we basically inherit from the male and the female that created you. In these days, I have to be a bit careful with who. It, obviously, we know that as our parents, but obviously, some people um, don't like to think of that way. But it's the man and the female that actually created you, and they give you a string of DNA. And that effectively, once that conception has happened, that starts your DNA sort of. It's really like an instruction booklet. And within that booklet, that DNA has different types of letters which make up words and those words will make a sentence. Now, unfortunately, occasionally, we do receive sentences that have letters in the wrong places or aren't in the right place at all. So effectively what happens is we, we really are looking at the different types of genes here. So on the left, your DNA consists of four chemical bases, which is what you can see on the left-hand side. Now your DNA is transcripted into RNA. That's just a really fun, funny sort of um, scientific word to say. It's basically copied into RNA, and then RNA is translated into a protein. So if you're thinking of um, going on holiday, you would have a translator um, if it's from one language to another, all right? So RNA is being translated into normally, uh, or obviously into proteins and or amino acids, all right? Now, these, um, pretty much what happens is uh, a single nucleotide polymorphism, which is what I'm gonna start to be talking about is this big long list of letters that we've got in our DNA. Unfortunately, sometimes the sentences, you know, sometimes there's a full stop in the wrong place. It's almost as if the sentences hasn't really looked at the grammar. So occasionally the letters are in the wrong places. So the words are actually made up of three bases, so they're known as a codon, and effectively they'll be making an amino acid. And all you really need to understand is that if there is a letter change, as you can see here, we've got A, U, A, and if those three letters were together, they will make the amino acid isoleucine. But if you inherit a change, in other words, the last letter has gone from an A, to a G that won't make isoleucine anymore, it will actually make methionine. Now for majority of the time, this does not make any difference to you, but there are actually times when that can make a big problem in regards to the resulting protein. And it might mean that that protein actually pretty much um, has a different job or it might not be as efficient as we would like it to be, it might mean it's more efficient than we would like it to be. And it's this that I'm really, really interested in. Now there's lots of different ways that companies can actually um, give uh, the, the information to you. Some use traffic light sim systems, some use the technical homozygous or heterozygous. You don't need to know that about that now, but some are using the actual names of the uh, genes themselves. Some are giving you the letters. Pretty much um, with regards to Team Gene, I will provide all of that and give you all of the, uh, basically I'll give you a bird's eye view of everything that actually goes on. So what I'm trying to say here is, is that effectively um, companies will give you results in different ways. So why do we want to know about bone health in regards to females? And I'm not unfortunately, but fortunately there's a good, a large, well, nearly 51% of the UK population is actually female. Yay, go females. Um, and effectively, that can actually have a, a, a 
well, it definitely has an effect on musculoskeletal performance and the injury, and it's certainly connected to sports related injuries. Now, you're probably thinking, how is it that um, something that females are obviously used to throughout the cycle, um, how is it that that is connected to that? And I, I will allude to that um, sooner for you. So let's have a look at the hormone cycle itself. And I really want to just highlight here that there are actually four different types of estrogens that are produced, that a female produces throughout their life. So two of them, they are actually only produced when pregnancy occurs. So in the literature, you'll find that they tend to only talk about the two that the females pretty much um, well, will produce up to and including menopause for one and the other one for the whole of their life. All right. So effectively, we produce four different types of estrogens, but two of them, which is E4, which you can see on the slide here, and um, E3, which is estrol and esterol, they pretty much are only produced when pregnancy is actually um, is, is actually happening. Most research will talk about E1, which is estrone, and they'll also predominantly talk about E2, which is estradiol. All right. So if you're looking at the, at the research, they tend to only tend to sort of allude to E1 and E2. Now, we are now pretty much looking at um, the um, normal predicted... And I'm sort of smirking here because there are, you know, there's obviously women in the audience here and you'll probably realise that the, the average monthly estrogen cycle isn't the norm, if you see what I mean. Most people are led to believe it's a 28 day cycle um, and that there is this fluctuation of estrogen throughout this whole uh, process. Um, what I will say to you guys is that um, when you're dealing with, with female athletes, there is a chance that their monthly cycle is actually 25 days long, or it could be 30 days long. So this is what we call the national average of the female cycle in regards to estrogen levels. All right. So if you're a trainer, you're a nutritionist, or you're dealing with or supporting female athletes, I'm not advocating that you should start a spreadsheet to plot, but there are certainly different times around the follicular phase and the luteal phase where it seems that females can either utilize certain foods better or they are actually have a higher risk of certain injuries. Um, and we're actually going to give you an insight into that. So I, I always say to people, you need to get in tune. You need to get in tune with this, this sort of phasula sort of um, dance that oestrogen does throughout this, this so-called cycle as such. Now, females seem to be able to utilize carbs more in their follicular phase. And follicular phase is from day one to around about day 13, day 14. Now, for the guys that don't, or I say guys, for anybody that doesn't know, day one is actually the first day of the, of the female period, okay? So from day one through to about day 13, it seems that women can actually utilise carbs better at the beginning of the cycle, and then they switch to being able to utilise fats and or amino acids, and obviously protein, more in the luteal phase, uh, I, I don't have any um, sort of scientific research to back up as to why that is in as much as I've got a feeling it's because if um, pregnancy occurs, then fats and amino acids are obviously needed as well as carbs, but perhaps slightly less for the uh, resulting pregnancy. However, if you're looking from an athletic point of view, um, maybe um, your female will athletes will actually um, be able to utilize carbs in the follicular phase and fats and amino acids in their uh, luteal phase. Now, 
there is research out there. It's not huge amounts of research, but there is research out there that um, sort of instigates that strength training is much more beneficial during the follicular phase. So day one to around about day 14. Now, don't go crazy because, of course, we don't want injuries. But if you're looking at different ways of being able to perhaps to increase or perhaps get better, um, you know, sometimes doing less is better, but actually strength training in the follicular phase um, is seen, you get better results by doing it within the follicular phase. That's what I'm trying to say to you is, all right? So, so when you're look, dealing with your athletes, maybe have a look at when are they doing their strength training as a, as a female, you might want to change it to the follicular phase and see if they actually get more benefit out of it. Now, when we're in, it seems also research has sort of found that when we're in the fluctuations of hormones, and as you can see, it fluctuates throughout the whole of the cycle. So I'm looking at that blue um, sort of fluctu fluctuation, which is estrogen. I apologize, this is obviously an American picture from my stocks that should have an O in the, at the beginning uh, for estrogen. Um, it tends to be that um, you have an increased injury risk when you have fluctuations in hormones. Now that's just a broad statement there, but they've actually almost sort of um, looked at ACL injuries just on their own, not really looked at any others. And it seems that ACL injuries are pretty much more, uh, or you are more susceptible to ACL injuries in the follicular and the ovulation stage. Um, it seems that there are less in the luteal phase. Now, athletes have many different types of injuries. And of course, that's only one particular type. Um, but if it means that you have a athlete, female athlete, who is perhaps has had higher amounts of um, ACL injuries, then maybe have a look at, try and plot and see when were they, if you're able to, um, and does that actually really sort of correlate? And if it does, then can you at least do something about their training? Or maybe if you've got two competitions that they may go in for, is maybe they'll choose one over the other because of the day and um, whether what phase that, that that athlete is in. So I would like to see more research in regards to this. Um, like I say, the ACL one is really fascinating. And of course, athletes have many injuries. But if we start to look at the different phases and we can then really start to sort of hone in when that particular athlete, and of course, it's obviously uh, personal to them, then you might be able to, and it would only be a small change here or there, it might mean that you would reduce the amount of ACL injuries and you might be able to increase the strength training, um, particular depending on where they are in their cycle. So depending on what the athlete is trying to achieve, if it is more strength, then maybe you could tailor to that to that particular rhythm. All right, so that's just some nice information with regards to the four, the, the uh, hormone sort of um, cycle of, of a, a female. Like I say, it's not always 28 days. If you work with female athletes, you'll get to realize that they have their own rhythms. But most women do get in tune pretty much with their body and they'll then start to realize of these fluctuations in hormones and when to actually sort of uh, rein their training back a little bit and or maybe try the strength training through the follicular phase and see how you get on I don't know why I'm losing my voice I don't feel um that should be happening but anyway let's have a go so let's have a look at bones so I've not included any genetics there um purely and simply because not everybody's going to be using genetics in their practice and that's absolutely fine it's not appropriate for absolutely everybody but it, at least um, you might be able to um, help your um, female athletes with regards to um, food intake and potential injury um, risk 
Um, so that might be able to, to, you might be able to help yourself on that one. So let's have a look at uh, our wonderful bones. And as in the little blurb that I gave at the very beginning to advertise this, we very rarely think about bones in regards to athletes because majority of the time they tend to have very healthy bones because they are obviously exercising. They tend to be eating, um, you know, very, very well. And therefore, in my opinion, the bones tend to be sort of almost sort of lost, really, unless they do have, you know, fractures and, and things like that. And more investigation is happened. But ordinarily, we wouldn't normally look at bone health with regards to, um, you know, athletes. But I want to just sort of um, perhaps spark a little seed in that those wonderful brains of yours, purely and simply because actually bone health can be, it's one of those hidden sort of um, um, diseases that um, can actually be happening for anybody that is even active, for instance. So your bones are remodeling consistently. Um, and the younger you are, the more you remodel. When I mean remodel, that means that there are cells that are called osteoclasts where they help to break down bone. Now, don't get me wrong, they're not actually physically breaking it down so that it's only that, you know, it literally will break a small about small amount down. I, I sort of see it as a bit, uh, some of you might you'll be too young to know, but if I remember sort of packing man is to go along and sort of eat um little um little things on that little avatar thing um i know what i'm trying to say little pac-man so i see osteoclasts as little pac-man basically and they go around the bones and they they pretty much hoover up all of the all the stuff that's old and decrepit and what's you know you need to get rid of but osteoblasts are there, they secrete new bones. So sort of, you know, sort of chucks out new bone and that's how bone is remodeled, all right? So bone homeostasis, most people are absolutely fine with if this is actually happening on a consistent basis. But as we get older, naturally, unfortunately, the ability to actually remodel bones actually slows down. As with most things in life, unfortunately, it either slows down or droops or drops off one of the two um, or three. Um, but pretty much with bone homeostasis, the ability to remodel bone is actually less of the older you get. So hence why a lot of people do get fractures and breaks as they're actually older. So this is what's happening with, with regards to your bones. Um, I'll just touch on osteoporosis because we do have athletes that have got osteoporosis or osteopenia, which basically is the beginning of osteoporosis. And um, we have athletes or people that are um, partaking in exercise who might want a help with a personal trainer, et cetera, because they have got osteoporosis. So some people are being healthy, um, and taking exercise because they've got um, this particular condition. All right. So, so you may come across um, a couple of people with that. There's three million osteoporosis um, um, sufferers in the UK and half a million of those do succumb to fractures. And it's not always um, due to age at all. We always think of osteoporosis as being as a uh, older age sort of uh, disease, but it's not. Um, and it's actually um, the potential of this, this remodeling of the bones. And that can be down to the fact that actually they're quite, they're much younger and there is a genetic perspective to that. There are more than 20 different genes that can sort of predict or give you a risk factor as to whether you are going to succumb to osteoporosis. So that's how big sort of the, the whole sort of um, field is. But I just wanted to give you an idea is that some of your athletes, and when I say athletes, these could be, you know, your five mile runners, these could be your 10. They don't have to be elite athletes. 
you know, the the um, dictionary of an athlete is somebody that has more than an hour's, um, you know, healthy exercise a week. Well, that's pretty much nearly all of us, hopefully. Um, but so always think about have this has this person come to you for their bone health, i.e. they need to do exercise in order to help with their bone health. OK, so just think about the potential that your client might be coming to see you for as well. Now, let's go back to females um, in regards to the fact that estrogen plays a big part in promotion of osteoclast uh, activity. Now, we don't want too much osteoclast activity because that's the one that's going to break it down. The way that I remember it is osteoblast be for build so we want you know more or homeostasis in the osteoblast activity but of course we need osteoclast but we don't want that that risk to be more towards the osteoclast now estrogen interestingly has a an effect on on bone remodeling and and we've it's not that long ago that we recently realized that estrogen itself just as itself is actually very very protective in the um, in the gut and in regards to intestinal permeability or dysbiosis so in other words somebody's got IBS for instance um, they sometimes or they could have um, there tends to be uh, like a if you look at the, if you think of the gut um, and, the, and the actual cell walls, you're thinking of these really tight junctions that keep whatever's in the gut in the gut. Now, unfortunately, when estrogen starts to reduce or when you've got an athlete that's got really low levels of estrogen, and that doesn't matter what, how old they are, um, the protective effect of these tight junctions, the junctions effectively become leaky. And that will then um, promote what we call endotoxin activity. So in other words, what that's saying is everything that's going through your gut, you know, potentially could be um, toxic to cells if it comes outside of that gut. So normally if it's nice and held together with those tight junctions, but as soon as the junctions become leaky, we've got potential of you know, foods or, or whatever's actually in that gut to be able to go through the intestinal wall. And unfortunately, that actually will then start a reaction that will it will basically start the immune to respond because there are pretty much things that are in places that they shouldn't be. I'm not talking a whole apple or anything like that. I'm talking about, you know, very small cells, for instance. And once you have an immune reaction, it will then spark um, something that's called cytokines. And those cytokines can eventually produce inflammation. Now, if you think of an athlete and what they're already doing, they are at a higher risk of producing inflammation naturally. If you've got somebody that's got slightly lower levels of estrogen or we've got estrogen um, in decline, then we may have a situation where we've got these leaky junctions and we've got this activity um, and we've got this immune response. Now, if we have an immune response, those cytokines, unfortunately, they don't promote osteoblast activity. They actually promote osteoclast activity. So in other words, they will promote the breakdown of the bone. Now, this is quite new uh, in the research in as much as it's been really attained mainly to sort of menopausal women, because obviously, um, you know, we've got a big reduction in estrogen there. But I've also found that particularly um, athletes have got lower levels of estrogen anyway for all sorts of different reasons. I'm not going to go into those now. Um, they could have this immune response. Now, I'm just going to add in the genetics into that. We, we can look at the genetics behind these cytokines. It's, it's known as an interleukin-6 and a TNF-alpha, or some of the research has dropped the alpha. Um, and effectively, what it means is, is if you have a SNPs, in other words, one of the amino acids is not coded properly, then effectively what might happen is 
the ability for interleukin-6 and TNF to be regulated isn't as efficient. So let me just roll that back a bit. Estrogen may be less protected if you've got less of it. You may have leaky junctions. You've got this immune response. You've got interleukin-6 and TNF becoming or producing inflammation. Inflammation will promote osteoclast activity, which is obviously will have a, an effect on the bone. If you then add in the genetics, which most people won't know if you've not had your, your genetics done, you could be at a higher risk, particularly if you've got SNPs on your interleukin-6 and TNF, that actually they go, it, the regulation of that immune response is nowhere near as efficient as we would like it to be. So you've almost got this sort of, you know, uh, a perfect storm almost um, being predicted here. Now, before you sort of go, oh gosh, what, what can I do about it? There, there is some more information for you. Now, we hopefully, if we have a healthy diet, and when I mean a healthy diet, most athletes do, but a lot of them sort of negate or do have gut issues. Some of them do have IBS or they just have gut issues because of what they're having to load or uh, if they're doing marathons and all sorts of different things. Now, in order to mediate the, um, the gut itself, there has been research that's found that there are three particular live bacterias. Now in the UK, we have to say they're live bacteria, but most of you will know them as probiotics. Um, and they are the three that are on the screen there. So that's Lactobacillus plantarum, heel nine, plantarum heel 19, and Paracasi 87002. Now, there has been some really good research into those three particular live bacteria where it actually helps to reduce the interleukin and TNF activity, which will then naturally reduce the osteoclast activity, which will then obviously help with the bone health. So you're going to reduce your osteoclast activity. Now, if you've got somebody that hasn't got good gut health, Personally, you would look at putting in good bacteria anyway, through fermented foods or whatever it might you might want to do. But these particular uh, strains have there is really decent research behind them to actually help to reduce the uh, cytokine activity, particularly because of the leaky junctions in the gut. Now, if you then add on the fact that maybe you've got SNPs on your interleukin six and TNF. Let's you know, just think maybe you might want to uh, encourage those three um, bacteria um, just in general, even if you're not looking at bone health. All right. So this is why I've put menopause in a question mark after it, it's because not all um, athletes have sufficient levels of estrogens for all sorts of different reasons. And it can be all different age ranges. Um, but of course, the most obvious time is when an uh, athlete goes into perimenopausal, which can be up to about 10 years prior to actually going through menopause. And the average age in the UK of women going into menopause is about 50, 51. All right. So you're looking at sort of ages of 40. Um, and so, again, it just depends on how old or uh, your athlete in regards to their estrogen levels. And you can go and get those checked quite easily. Um, but also you need to go and find um, these particular uh, bacteria as well. There are obviously uh, products out there that you can do um, that you can go and buy. Now, this is quite a new mechanism. Um, and therefore, a lot of people won't actually know about it. Not, there, there is a good research out there, but there's not huge amounts of research. So, again, I like to offer information. It's not just about the genetics. It's like, what can you do? Um, and looking at um, gut health is definitely something that you can do in order to reduce that endotoxin activity, to reduce that immune response to reduce that inflammatory cascade that goes on and therefore you're going to be reducing the osteoclast activity but again you can add in the genetics behind that as well if you want to do so
So this is just a, a little slide just to give you a bit of, um, you know, um, uh, additional context with regards to that is that um, if you have got, um, you know, if you have an athlete who is uh, perhaps pursuing in quite a, 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 an inflammatory sort of um, exercises or whether it's boxing, or whether it's long term running, whatever it might be, you would increase their antioxidants, you would increase their anti inflammatory foods. So all of your brightly colored vegetables, your berries, your turmeric, all of those rosemaries, that sort of stuff, you would look at pre and probiotic foods. Um, and they have abundance of information is obviously on the internet. But I would look for these three live bacteria, or as we all know them, as um, probiotics, which obviously we can't say here in the UK. So that's just one connection between females, estrogen and bone health. And it's really all to do with that immune response. OK, now, interestingly, um, we know once we actually got, once we actually made the estrogen, so females have to make estrogen, we have to, um, it has to go and sit on the receptors for it to be exerted. So you know, that's where you get all of your lovely sort of um, monthly cycle. But then we need to package the estrogen up into a nice little parcel so then it's available for it to be actually excreted okay so there it's you've got this lovely uh, you've got an estrogen cycle but we also um and i'm not going to go through the whole uh, cycle uh, regards to how to make estrogen today but there is a whole huge great big pathway in regards to how we actually make estrogen how we actually exert it how we get in this into this nice little package and how we actually excrete it okay so people always just look at estrogen and how it is in the cycle but in my opinion you've got to also understand how we actually make it and how we break it down as well now that's for another webinar and maybe um uh, ian and i and have a, a sort of look on on being able to get that out to you guys but um, I'm going to just literally look at one particular area, and that is estrogen receptors. Now, you guys, you might think that you're being left out at the moment, but actually men have obviously do have estrogen receptors as well. Um, and effectively, um, we can actually have a look at the, they're known as ESR receptors, and, and they are really the star of the show in regards to pretty much how the hormones really work. So as I say, that there is this big sort of um, pathway that goes on with regards to estrogen. Now, it all starts with cholesterol. So one of the easiest things that you can do is if you find that your client or your athlete has got low levels of, est of estrogen, you want to go and check their cholesterol levels because if they haven't got enough cholesterol, then they're not going to be able to produce naturally the right amount of estrogen because it all starts with cholesterol and all of you can send your athletes to the gp and get their cholesterol checked all right so that's really really easy now estrogen receptors that's where obviously the estrogen actually exerts its effect and like i say it needs to be packaged up ready to be removed um, and there are certain genes that we need to use for that. And then it needs to be excreted. But it's ESR, so the estrogen receptor that is the star of the show with regards to that and athletes. There's two particular papers here, uh, which are all open access. All of the research that I use in all my presentations, I try my hardest to use open access. Um, and ESR1, which is the estrogen receptor, I mean, pretty much what they've start or what they've started to, to look at um, is that polymorphism, so in other words, a SNP, so in other words, it means that there is a, a change in that base or the last letter. Um, it's, it is, a, they have found an association with muscle injury and muscle stiffness. So depending on your result from your ESR gene result, and you've got the RS number there as well, it can mean that you are at a higher risk. Now, when I'm talking about genetics, I'm always talking about the risk of it. It doesn't mean it's actually going to be 100, you know, it's 
definitely going to happen, but it might mean that you are at a higher risk of something happening. And therefore, if you know that, you can then perhaps either negate it or at least support uh, what that might actually mean. OK, so in this uh, particular one, now bearing in mind, this, as you'll see, is actually in Japanese athletes and they will have very slightly different. And this is my little bit of critique of this particular paper is that obviously Caucasian um, um, adults or humans uh, and Japanese, um, they may have a slightly different um, results in regards to their genetics. But I always find it's good to find out what, other, what else is going on around the world. And they've seen in this particular uh, research paper that if you have the, the, the um, C allele, or in other words, the uh, SNP, the results in a significantly less muscle stiffness than the T allele. And it was quite a big study as well. I mean, I do find that a lot of studies are in, you know, got sort of 10 or 12 people in them, which are, are appropriate. They're almost like pilot studies, um, but there was a, a decent amount of people in this one. All right. So again, I want to just, just stretch your brains a little bit and, and sort of open up Pandora's box for you and sort of say to you that please don't just think of muscle stiffness and um, maybe, you know, muscle injury to do with getting loads of magnesium in and, you know, all the usual stuff. It might actually be involved to do with estrogen and the receptors. And even if you don't really understand what they are, that doesn't matter. It just means that there is something else that you need to think about in regards to the actual estrogen in regards to uh, where they are in their in their cycle all right so again I just want to open your brain I'm one of those people that just likes to find all these sort of different aspects and trying to put them all together in the pathways and then seeing and hoping that they're you know I can speak to these guys and say how does this work and and obviously in this particular research, they have found that correlation. Um, and maybe there's more here in the UK that we could perhaps uh, do a research uh, study on as well. Now, interestingly, estrogen itself, just uh, as itself, it actually downregulates interleukin-6. It's one of its natural sort of um, jobs that, that happens in the body, okay? So estrogen actually regulates interleukin-6. So in other words, as I've said to you before, interleukin is this, this cytokine that is involved in inflammatory processes, and it's part of that inflammatory cascade. And estrogen almost keeps it in check. Now, if you've got lower levels of estrogen, then, then, you know, potentially this could result in more viruses. And, and, you know, I find that a lot of um, ultra marathons or marathon runners, they tend to develop these upper respiratory tract infections. Yes, of course, it could be down to the, the way that they're breathing. It could be down to the environment as to what they're, where they are. It could be down to the fact that perhaps they don't always take their rest days. But I also want to introduce to you that, particularly if it's in females, is it actually an estrogen flux that they may or may not have? And therefore, interleukin-6, in other words, this, this uh, inflammatory cascade, might mean that they are more susceptible to respiratory tract infections, all right? And it's because estrogen actually regulates interleukin-6. Now, interestingly, if you've got a SNP on your interleukin-6, this actually negates the protection. So if you have somebody that is an athlete but suffers a lot with URTIs, then maybe, it's not going to be the only thing, but maybe a risk factor or a potential part of the picture is that they may have SNPs on their interleukin-6. Now, it won't be just one gene, but that's definitely part of the picture. Um, and as we know, um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of athletes do um, get respiratory tract infections, particularly in endurance athletes. And maybe if we could find out what their um, what their what their 
status with regards to the genetics in regards to interleukin-6, we might be able to see if they are more susceptible. And if they are, we can do something about that. Again, look at the estrogen levels as well. So, you know, those are sort of things, again, I want to just put that seed in your brain and open your eyes up to that for you. I'm also really, really in favour of looking at cofactors because the body never really works in isolation. It always uses other sort of nutrients in order for a pathway to actually work properly. So when I talk about a pathway, I'm talking about how we actually make estrogens, how we break them down. When I'm talking about bone health, you know, how the remodeling happens, it's going to be using cofactors. And it's this where I believe all of you guys can have a really easy win with your athlete because if you can actually get all of your cofactors at, opt at optimal levels, not in excess, but in optimal levels, then you are doing the best for that athlete or if you, you know, for, for, for whatever you're trying to do. Now, the first one I'm going to talk about is actually collagen. And because we know that collagen is obviously um, involved with regards to uh, bone health, the osteoblasts actually uh, produce a, it's like a, uh, it's a mucilin sort of uh, jelly, which then eventually becomes collagen. So that the two obviously are very, very intrinsically linked. And I've not done thousands, but I've probably seen enough genetic results now to be convinced that pretty much nearly all of us have got SNPs on our collagen uh, genes with regards to type 1 collagen. And so what that actually means is the enzyme that that gene is actually coding for, so in other words, to, to, to produce the collagen, is nowhere near as efficient as we would like it to be. So, you know, when we're looking at um, uh, collagen for just for athlete health in, in general, we're going to have to look at how to support these guys with regards to collagen production, because we need it. We need it. it's really, really important, not just for bone health. It's important for all other ligaments, you know, everything. It's the glue. It's the glue that holds everything pretty much together. So we need to make sure we've got our proline, glycine and hydroxyproline, which is also a derivative of proline. And that tends to be in um, animal um, based uh, foods. We do get proline and glycine in um, vegetable sources or vegan sources, uh, predominantly, obviously, in, um, you know, sort of uh, different types of um, proteins, vegetable proteins. But I will be slightly concerned that the amount of protein that you have to eat from a, a, a vegetarian uh, sort of perspective as to whether you're really going to be able to provide the right amount of uh, uh, amino acids. And your body will actually store these amino acids. They'll use them up over time. Um, and so that's why a lot of people that are on a um, plant based, they feel brilliant at the beginning. And then about two years later, they don't feel so well. And that's because all their reserves are pretty much um, um, uh, sort of used up. But ACL injuries, as we know, are linked to estrogen receptors. Estrogen receptors inhibits the synthesis of type 1 collagen. So there we go. That's one thing that we need, really need to think about. And again, we know roughly how to do that now. Now, iron um, is really very much uh, needed for bone health. Um, I did talk about um, iron in the first webinar, so um, you can go back to that. But there is a subset of um, humans, um, namely athletes, who have SNPs on their, they're called HFE genes. And basically, if you have SNPs on those, you have the what you're at a higher risk of being able to regulate iron or your iron in your body. So in other words, you are much higher risk of iron overload, which we know can be inflammatory. Excess iron inflammatory is going to promote an inflammatory 
um, cascade, which we know now is going to promote an osteoclast activity. So just be mindful of iron. Most athletes, females can be quite iron or low in iron, but just be mindful if you've got SNPs on your HFE gene and you do take iron, then you are the one that could actually get to really high levels of iron. And then you're going to go into what we call um, iron sort of overload. And that is more of an oxidative and that's going to start the um, inflammatory sort of cascade. Now, just a few more slides. I won't be long now. So we know that vitamin D is very, very much uh, intrinsically linked with bone health. Um, I look at at least uh, four different types of uh, vitamin D genes. And because I want to know if you're actually converting from D2 into D3, because D3 is the active form. And it's that that we need in order to be able to utilize the vitamin D. There is a particular globulin or the, it's known as GC gene. Um, and that role is in binding the vitamin D ready for the transport into the cell from the blood so I need to know if that's actually working properly. I want to know about vitamin D receptors or VDR because that's going to bind to your vitamin D3 for activation um, and also uh, VDR is actually uh, crucial in regards to actually um, um, uh, what am I just trying to say uh, bone health and obviously calcium status as well and NADSYN1 I'm not going to give you the acronym for that one um, but it's in the notes at the end um, people that have got SNPs on this particular gene are just found to have less circulating vitamin D levels so I try and look at all of that with regards for for a whole picture calcium now, calcium is tightly regulated, like properly tightly regulated, but the CASR gene, basically, it's almost like a, a gate. It allows the amount of calcium in and out as and when it's needed in order to keep the homeostasis, um, and it regulates the amount of calcium in the blood. Snips on that then that might mean that the regulation of the amount of calcium in the blood might be uh, insufficient. So these are the people that have got higher levels of calcium in their blood. There's also a CYP24A1. This all helps with calcium homeostasis and the metabolism of active vitamin D. So we would want to know about that one as well because that's really important for bone health. And the last one is magnesium really important mineral many functions 50 to 6 percent of which is all to do with skeletal system and the stores and the gene here that i look at is tmpr6 and that actually has been found if you're looking at the risk factors for that one in regards to actually cellular levels of magnesium in the cell itself um, so, of course, if somebody's got low levels of magnesium going in, have a snip on this one, then actually magnesium levels might actually be low as well. So let's have a quick sum up. Different times of the female uh, cycle can affect or contribute to injuries. Look at moving, uh, different training or competitions. Look at the macronutrients at certain times of the month. Um, think about bone health, where you just presume it's all OK because the person is active, but actually people are active because of their bone health. OK, um, think of the different foods and the live bacteria that might help with gut health to reduce the inflammation, uh, inflammation production. And you could be at a high risk of lower mineral status due to your genetics. So that's the sort of thing you might want to start to think about as well. So hopefully I've sort of brought your brain from the same old thinking to some new, new thinking and some new things that you can um, have a look at. But thank you very much. Um, it's lovely to uh, be able to do this for you guys. I know Ian, you wanted to show some slides, so I'll stop sharing for you. Thank you, Karen. We'll we'll go on to um, we'll go on to questions in a moment. I'm just going to share with you a couple of things. So, firstly, we've got our next intake of the Certificate of Integrative Sports Nutrition course in two weeks' time. So, 
if that's good timing for you, give me a shout. You can just um, go, go, if you haven't looked at it, go through our website, intsportsnutrition.com and have a look at the course page. We've basically got three different modules going through an integrative or functional perspective in sport. That's our main point of difference. The other one is uh, we're very practitioner focused on the course. So we go through a very applied performance nutrition uh, module and then bring specialists uh, in on module three so that you can start to specialize your own practice more. Another thing I'd like to just introduce quickly is um, we've got um, an extra webinar. We've got our monthly webinar series uh, like this one with Karen. I brought in an extra one uh, where I'm going to be interacting with Elaine Wilkins, who's the founder of the Chrysalis Effect Chronic Fatigue Organization next week. Because myself as a practitioner, um, I see a lot of cr chronic fatigue scenarios and autoimmune scenarios in sport. So we want to kind of have a back and forth discussion. So that that's actually lunchtime UK time next uh, is it Tuesday or Wednesday? I think it's Tuesday. So yeah, have a look at that. Um, and there's uh, website information. Okay, we will send out this and Karen's slides tomorrow and also a link to the recording. All right. So I'm gonna start with a question from Justin. So <laughs> as, <laughs> as Karen, uh, works on Justin's question, please fire through some extra questions. Get them lined up for us. <laughs> All right. You ready? Justin oh, asks cool. a difficult question, so there you go. Right. If reduced estrogen is less protective in terms of intestinal permeability, are women more susceptible during the early follicular and late luteal phase, especially if combined with high intensity training or high carb stroke refined diets? Also, is there any research looking at prebiotic or high fiber diets on similar pathways to the three probiotic strains that you mentioned? Some good questions there. There are actually, I, I'm, so I'm going to go for the last one. Unfortunately, uh, prebiotics and fiber, um, you know, research into um, those sort of things are, they're not lacking, but they're not specific to intestinal permeability, um, whereas those particular live bacteria strains have been. Um, it's not to say um, that, um, you know, we, it couldn't be done in the future, but I haven't found any, um, and hence why I couldn't actually put it in the presentation. But I would certainly agree that um, prebiotics and fiber certainly should help with intestinal permeability as well. It's just that the research isn't there, so I couldn't put it in. Yeah, there's no... There's no sort of financial gain to studying fiber, is there? Whereas, you know, patented pro products, you get the research much easier. Absolutely, yeah. I've um, got a question for you, Karen. Um, you were talking about the, the metabolism of the substrates, um, carbon fat, uh, with regard to the female menstrual cycle. What, what is it that's been found? I mean, what physiologically is changing there? Do you have any idea what, what metabolically is happening so that they can sh women can shift into a better carb metabolism state in follicular? I think, I think because actually at the very beginning of the cycle, the estrogen is actually lower. If you realize that the estrogen starts to go up and then obviously raises a lot um, around about the day 14, and it drops and then goes back up again in the uh, second part in the luteal phase. And I wonder whether there is a link between um, carb metabolism and estrogen levels, um, and hence why they're able to actually um, utilize those at the beginning of the cycle in, instead of the 
um, second half of the cycle. I do wonder whether it's actually to do with um, uh, with pregnancy in regards to um, um, getting ready for conception, because obviously each month that's the point of the of the of actually um, the ovulation is hopefully that the egg is going to be um, you know. Um, become a, a fetus for instance but obviously that doesn't happen all the time and I wonder whether actually it's to do with that and the ability then to utilize the proteins and the fats for the baby that could be um, you know um, be in utero at that particular time but the actual research is pretty much looking at women have actually found that they have can metabolize um, uh, carbs more in that phase they haven't gone into why yet so again there's so much more research that we need to do but I wonder whether there is it's to do with babies <laughs> yeah so it's I mean I've found that myself as well in genetic research there's a lot of association studies you know that this is related to that but not physiologically why um so yeah as you said there's a lot more understanding to come and presumably you'd put that kind of advice or recommendation over to a female athlete on top of their what you already understand about them individually from a metabolic perspective which we've got quite a few snips on now already haven't we in terms yes. of carb fat metabolism preference yes Yes, we've got the TCFL7 like two, just from memory, uh, looks at carb uh, metabolism, um, which is the main one that they look at. Um, and there's obviously a couple of others. Um, but again, I would like uh, research if on, on that in regards to estrogen cycle as well. Um, but the, the fascination of this research for me is that whilst we have research saying this does this but we don't have a reason why if you speak to individual you know to athletes and they say but my body craves carbs prior to my period starting or as it actually is you i know that research doesn't like n equals one but anecdotal evidence for that particular athlete I feel also needs to be taken into consideration because, you know, um, research in a wider world, I'm for it. I love it. I think it's brilliant. But when you're looking at a human being on an individual basis, you've also got to take into consideration their own rhythms and their own evidence. Um, and then if you can put all of that together, which is what I try and do, which is, you know, quite mind-boggling sometimes that's when I feel as though we're finally getting to the to the the point of of that what that person is trying to achieve and like when I say when we're talking about athletes I'm not just talking about elite athletes I'm talking about somebody that does you know couch to 5k and you're the PT that's trying to get them there you know or you know or it could be the marathon runner you know um so yeah they've got to also think about their own bodies um, and people that are doing that types of things, they do normally know what their body's trying to tell them. You've just shared really important information there, which I want to just reiterate because it's what I talk about a lot as well. When you're working with a client, you need to build that bigger picture. So although you're, you know, you're a specialist in genetics, you're not just looking at their SNPs, you're asking a whole, you know, timeline of health history and getting to know the person. So the way I'm describing this now is like you're painting a picture and each bit of information is another brush stroke. So genetic tests will provide a certain number of brush strokes. Your questionnaire will provide another one, actually meeting the person and, and tuning into their energy and their rhythms and their subtleties are a whole load of other ones. Yeah. And, and the human body has got many different rhythms. Um, we look at circadian rhythms. So, you know, on a national, we say that there is a 24 hour clock, but actually, 
Humans have a 23 and a half hour clock or a 24 and a half hour clock. Our muscles have clocks. They like to, you know, utilize the glucose during the day. They don't at night when we're supposed to be asleep. That's when it utilizes, you know, other things it's trying to repair and things like that. So there's, you know, our other systems have different types of clocks. So you've got to try and look at the other rhythms that are going on and research doesn't that's the downfall of research is because you can't really look at that on an individual basis because you're trying to get a whole load of people together and squish them into the same sort of um, uh, category. But I love research and it's, and it's the best thing ever. But, you know, we've also got to look at both. I think you just got to look at both sides of the coin, in my opinion. Contextualize the information. Mm. Yeah. Um, I've got a question from Tina. Uh, is there a particular product which contains those three probiotic bacteria that you mentioned? Uh, there, there is. Um, and there is actually a research paper uh, which will be on the slides um, specifically uh, for the research of those particular three. Um, it is a product that is called, off the top of my head, it is called Biome Osteo, and it is by a company called Activated Probiotics. And you can only get those if you are a practitioner um, from the normal practitioner places. Um, it's not uh, available for the, you know, so you can't buy it in Holland or Barrett, let's put it that way. But if anybody isn't a practitioner who is on this call and would like to have a try, let me know and I can I can use my thing and pass a discount on to them. That's I would hate somebody who would want to try it but can't get to it. So just just email me. It's not a problem. OK, any other questions before we finish, everyone? I probably bamboozled so many people on that, like, giving them so much info, but it's just the way that my brain works. It's just, you know, you, you can't just look at something in isolation, in my opinion. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I'll just say very quickly, I gave uh, Justin a bit of an answer about collagen the other day. And I probably went or away off the scale, bless him. Now he gets to know how it all works up here. Yeah, it's it's about complexity thinking. It's about that individuality. It's a context. It's getting to know the person, bringing in all this complex biochemistry. It's it's a difficult thing to to do a good job. Um, and but we don't need to all know it as complex as complexly as you do. Um, we just need to start somewhere and, yeah. and recognize that, you know, a research paper saying, you know, X equals whatever, that that doesn't apply to everyone or it doesn't apply neatly to everyone. Yeah. So, you know, like the carb metabolism question, that's such an individual thing and we need to figure that, that out. So yeah. even though we've got a research paper that's looked at 20 people and come out with a conclusion, we still need to bring it to an end of one. So yeah, really important. Yeah. Any last comments uh, before we finish, Karen? Uh, no, I just would like to thank you very much for allowing me to do the webinar. I've loved it as ever. And I hope, um, you know, everybody's been able to sort of follow. <laughs> And um, if you need anything, then um, give me a shout. Thanks, Karen. No Are you worries. up for one next year again? Of course. Great. Okay. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, we've got another one, as I say, next week already. And then uh, the start of July will be the next regular monthly webinar. So please, please keep joining and tuning in. Thank okay, you. So good night, everyone. Yeah. Ciao, guys.